We're going to talk about terminal services and similar types of services because we're giving remote access to things like routers and firewalls and other servers uh, over untrusted connections. And so it's critical that we're, if we're using things like terminal services and RDP and VNC, that we're in secure environments. RDP sessions, for example, they can use native encryption, but they don't authenticate the session host servers, TLS certificates. They can also use these to connect to VDI environments as well, virtual desktop environments, terminal services, remote desktop protocol, RDP, VNC, and Citrix really should be run in a VPN, either an IPsec VPN with Suite B cryptography, or if we're using SSL VPN, it should be TLS 1.2 or higher. Notice in this screenshot, by the way, that we're using the AnyConnect Secure Mobility Client. And over there, I want you to notice that under the protocol, it says DTLS. So a lot of modern TLS environments, especially with an agent, will initially start out with uh, TLS over TCP, but then it will switch over to Datagram TLS in order to support conferencing and audio and video and things that are latency sensitive. So often when you think you're using TLS, you're actually using the Datagram version, which we're using here. So let's use VPNs like this one to protect those terminal services, those Citrix sessions, those VNC sessions with this Cypher suite, RSA and AES-256 and SHA-1. VNC is similar to Remote Desktop Protocol, but it uses a different protocol known as RFB. It's platform independent. Uh, it's a server client protocol. It typically uses TCP port 5900, but it commonly uses TCP port 5900, but it actually can use different agreeing ports for these services. You need to be aware of that, okay? Now, it uses, like I said, the RFB protocol, which, by the way, is not exam-worthy, but it stands for Remote Frame Buffer, okay? And remember, uh, for example, VNC could be used to do things like connecting a Linux server to an OSX laptop, okay? So if we're going to use VNC, let's use Secure Shell version 2 or TLS 1.2. Notice in this diagram that we're using Cisco's portal, and this could be you know, uh, part of a portal of a clientless solution through a supported browser, or they could be using their AnyConnect uh, VPN client. Either way, notice that there's a section over there that says web applications. You can use plugins or smart tunneling solutions, if no plugins available, to allow for your VPN to protect things like VNC, Citrix, terminal services, secure shell, even SiteMinder single sign-on or legacy Java RDP. So if you're using, let's say, Cisco's VPN solution, or maybe you're using Palo Alto's Global Protect, let's make sure that these terminal services type applications are being fully protected with strong crypto protective suites. Now I've mentioned Caspi's CASB quite a bit uh, throughout this series. And so let's kind of officially talk about it now. A CASB is a cloud access security broker. And along with using those terminal services type tools, we're seeing a lot of organizations using software as a service or SaaS. So they're using things like Salesforce, Office 365, Workday, uh, Google Drive, uh, Yammer, and there's, I mean, there are just literally hundreds of SaaS solutions out there. And as I was flying out here to do this training, I was sitting next to a guy and, you know, we, you know, struck up a conversation and it come to find out he works for a very small startup company and they have their own SaaS solution, their own uh, CRM for customer management solution. It's a small company, but they have their own SaaS solution. So there's tons of startups out there. It's, it's almost kind of like everybody has, a, uh, has an iPhone app company where they create apps. Well, there's a ton of SaaS companies out there, which opens up the need for better security. So a cloud access security broker can provide a wide variety of services between our enterprise and our SaaS provider, 
firewall solutions, identity management that's context-based. So it's not just based on their IP address. It can be tied to some you know, LDAP directory entry or some E directory or Active Directory. They provide anti-malware or what I call anti-X, okay? So anti-malware, anti-spam, anti-spyware, um, you know, just ant X as in anti a lot of things. It also can protect us with our data loss and data leakage. So I would say the DLP services from a CASP are extremely important. In addition, we can encrypt and decrypt the traffic going from our enterprise. Maybe we have a next generation CPE kind of virtual uh, edge that we're using and we're going up to their cloud. Uh, we can encrypt and decrypt. We can uh, have extra controls, single sign-on, and unified threat management. So CASPs provide a wide variety of services for us. Some of the top CASPs out there, uh, Palo Alto has what's called Aperture, which is really a kind of a next generation that provides a lot of other features like their wildfire analysis and their context-based identity services. App ID and other things, you can integrate your firewall solution into a CASP as well. Also, uh, a Netscope, Cypher Cloud, these are some of the top ones out there. I'm not endorsing any of these, but uh, you might want to research these to learn more. These are constantly evolving and adding new features, okay? Like I said, single sign on, anti phishing, identity management. So there's BitGlass, Semantic Cloud Sock. Oracle Cloud, Cloud Codes uh, is another one. Cloud Codes uh, is a CASP that provides single sign-on, identity management, anti-phishing, adaptive access control. So we will revisit the topic of the CASP in greater detail in lesson 13.4. But uh, I've already mentioned CASP several times, so I think this was a good time for me to kind of, you know, define them for you and to lay out the importance of a CASP if you're using, you know, software as a service.